Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming out on this, uh, I don't know what kind of night it is in California, but this night in California, thank you for being here. My wife announced to me that <clears throat> there may be snow tonight in Atlanta, which means the city will be paralyzed uh, because about one inch of snow is enough to paralyze Atlanta. The Toronto friends of ours will be laughing their, their heads off when they find that out, but uh, anyway, so I hope there's no snow so my wife can get to the airport tomorrow, otherwise I won't meet her. It really was a delight to be with the uh, young people and the staff today here and to just have their questions, to hear their hearts and their honesty and uh, just wonderful young people and very ready to engage and even with someone uh, grey-haired like me they were willing to ask some questions and uh, it really was a good time. So thanks parents for allowing your children to be here. <clears throat> now the theme tonight I'm going to speak on is uh, we do a little bit of thinking on our thinking caps in the nature of truth. but. A number of years ago, my colleague uh, Ravi was speaking at one of the American military bases, as he's done several times. And after the event, there were questions coming from the students, and one of the chaplains was making a comment on the way out. And the chaplain said to Ravi, he said, you know, I really think, as I've thought about the Christian life over time, the most important thing, he said, is love. And Ravi responded to him and said, well, I, actually, I think it's truth. And the, the chaplain says, you know, I'm pretty sure that, it, that it's love. <laughs> and Ravi says, well, can I ask you a question? He says, yes. He says, do you think that's true? <laughs> I don't know if Ravi comes up with these things, but that's the way it is. The very question of truth has a cultural moment embedded in it, particularly in this season. It, reels, it, reel, it reveals what is in our culture the, a, a, a ruling construct, which is the supremacy of doubt. The doubt is the fundamental pr principle of America and most of the Western world today. The notion seems to have deeply ingrained all of our culture, our institutions, uh, and many of our uh, parts of our world that we can't really know anything really, truly, or practically unless, of course, we can prove it by reason or experience alone. And that's very much the fruit of our age, but it's the, the philosophical heritage, if you like, of the 17th and 18th centuries. We kind of have a hangover still trying to hold on to ideas that have passed their sell-by date in some sense. <laughs> the postmodern turn unleashed within culture a deep animus to what they thought were privileged discourses, people who are, were able to say certain things in certain ways and control others, or views. So we've all learned from cradle to grave to suspect things like hidden motives, concealed interests. We've got so used to reading between the lines that many of us can't read the lines anymore because we're always looking for the subtext, the hidden agenda. And this now has become a part of life where motives and motivation seems to be everything. And we can't actually hear at times what is being said. Now, one of the architects of this, as we well know, was the French writer Michel Foucault. And he said this, warning us to beware anybody speaking of power. He said, truth isn't outside power or lacking in power, contrary to a myth. Truth isn't the reward of free spirits the child of protracted solitude, nor the privilege of those who have succeeded in liberating themselves. Truth is a thing of this world. It is produced only by virtue of multiple forms of constraint, and it induces regular effects of power. Each society has its regime of truth, its general politics of truth. That is, the types of discourse which it accepts and makes function as true. And of course, a lot of Foucault's work was looking at the genealogy of morals and beliefs and ideas of the university and the education system as being factories of consensus management, building views and selling this into the culture so that there are control me mechanisms all in all of life. But as popular postmodernism has, has really become the bloodstream of our culture, we encounter a kind of insistent relativism, or at least what late C.S. Lewis would call the triumph of subjectivity in terms of thought, ideas, and conviction. So truth is what I personally can believe, trust, or master. So we're all convinced that truth is some kind of a, a subjective state, an emotional condition, something that I personally inhabit. We don't think of truth in terms of something external, objective, or independent very often. But I want to here draw an important contrast, because it is important in a world in which we are hit with mass nonsense and blubber over the television, the Twitters, the tweets, and everything else. All that Twitters is not gold. <laughs> so we need to have relativism when it comes to beliefs. 
And a healthy skepticism is necessary. There are all kinds of things being peddled and sold, and a certain amount of relativism is necessary to question these, these different beliefs. But relativism, when you come to the view of truth, can be a severely philosophical error. So relativism about beliefs, asking questions about things that need to be questioned, but not denying that truth is possible, needs to be something that we have to deal with. Now, the mood of our times makes honest and open inquiry somewhat challenging. Every era has what Peter Berger, the sociologist, calls a plausibility structure. What is that? This is an influential control mechanism in terms of what is, or what is or what is not socially or publicly acceptable. I remember hearing this story and it was in Britain, about these uh, mission, these gentlemen who went from one of the British societies and they were to meet this man coming in, coming back from the mission field. He was to come to a very important meeting and there were going to be all kinds of dignitaries. But when the man arrived at Euston Station in London and stepped off the train, they were absolutely horrified because he was naked. In Britain, stepping off a train naked. Now, by naked, what they meant was he didn't have a hat on. <laughs> now we can laugh because in the conventions of our time, the very notion that someone be considered naked without a hat, a man, is a joke, isn't it? But in the conventions of the time, it was a ruling construct and it carried real power. These are the types of things that we have around that we're often blind to our own social conventions that control what questions we're allowed to ask and what is publicly appropriate. We call this the sociology of knowledge. Peter Berger says, the sociology of knowledge must concern itself with whatever passes for knowledge in a society. And insofar as all human knowledge is developed, transmitted, and maintained in social situations, the sociology of knowledge must seek to understand the processes by which this is done in such a way that a taken for granted reality congeals for the man in the street. So here we have the idea is that all Ideas, and many young people get this from great sources of philosophical influence like Star Trek and Walt Disney and so forth, that all of life is a social construction. And in part, there are all kinds of beliefs. America is a smorgasbord of the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. A number of years ago, after having, done, uh, having been berated by the same kinds of questions, I came up with what I called the McAllister summary of confusions from everyday life, and there were eight recurring themes that I get, and still get to this day, even though those, these were written down a number of years ago, misbeliefs about the nature of life. And as a Christian, these were coming from people in churches as well as people to the church about the nature of reality. And here are some of the, the misbeliefs I came up against. First of all, that people are essentially, though not always practically, good. Well, that is a real problem with John Calvin and Augustine and well, the Bible, but we won't go there at the moment. <laughs> Secondly, sincerity, sincerity overrules or trumps all other concerns or considerations. It doesn't matter if you get it right. It doesn't matter if you get it wrong. It just matters if you're sincere. Were you really being sincere? Because that's what really counts. By the way, Adolf Hitler was sincere in killing Jews. Sincerity is a dangerous test for truth. Truth as a belief is socially disruptive or divisive. Fourthly, distinctions and differences don't really matter. Infinite variety and infinite combinations, as Star Trek said. Um, five, people generally need to be accepted with no qualifying considerations. Culture or biology determines most things. It's your destiny, Luke. All bias, prejudice, which you could read as real convictions, are wrong. So the one thing is you can't be right about something because that makes you wrong for being right. So don't have any convictions. And making someone feel bad, number eight, is the greatest sin in life. This is the therapeutic mandate. You absolutely don't want to make someone feel bad. I mean, that is the, with a capital T, number one sin. So it therefore becomes a major problem for Christian kinds of views to be stated as being true. Christianity, for example, that believes that we have a revelation from God, that we believe that God has come in Jesus the Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is the deliverer. It would be all right for me to say subjectively, Corey, I believe this is true for me, that, that's okay. But if I was trying to imply to you that I think that's objectively true and you should believe it, oh, that's a no-go area. You in your small corner and I in mine. But we'll come back to this. You see, a couple of things we need to bear in mind. Because we can't know everything about everything, it doesn't mean that we can't know something about many things. 
And here you get this, again, an all or nothing equation where you get people, unless we have mastered all knowledge, answered every question, exhausted every avenue, listened to every CD that Ravi's ever made and Billy Graham and everybody else under the sun and got them all under, if we can't know everything about everything, then we must live by perpetual doubt because there might be one piece of information that brings the whole house down. You know, I get up in the morning and I know where my toothbrush is, generally speaking. Uh, I can get to places, I can, you know, go to my bank, I can do all kinds of things. I don't need to have exhaustive knowledge to function in life. I need to have trust in some of the things that I already know. And trust and faith are not blind knowledge. They're a part of everyday life in order for us to function. But secondly, we can know some things meaningfully, we can know a lot of things truly, and we can, live, we can know most things sufficiently. You see, we cannot know most things, including or especially God, exhaustively. But we can know him sufficiently. So because I, I don't have all knowledge of what God is like under every conceivable con, uh, uh, condition to answer every conceivable question, doesn't mean to say that the knowledge of God that I have is, isn't real. It's just not exhaustive. It's a limited knowledge. I know the infinite one with a tiny microcosm of knowledge. But it is real knowledge to me. And it is real. But I've just raised up questions. And, you know, when, when you come to philosophy, you always raise more questions. Right, brother? So, what is the really real and who says? You did ask that question, didn't you? This is what we were talking about with the students this morning. We have to start with the question of the nature of reality. Because that's what it is we're discussing. When I'm talking to a Muslim, I'm asking about what's the nature of reality. Either Allah is God or God. And Jesus Christ is God. They can't both be the same because the Quran denies that Jesus was the Son of God, risen from the dead. It affirms Jesus is a prophet. It affirms that Jesus was real. It does not say that he was crucified. Many Hindus will accept that Jesus was an avatar, but he wasn't the Son of God. And the, so they can't, they're not saying the same things about the same thing. So very famously, the Roman procurator Pontius Pilate in John chapter 18, 37, he's standing with Jesus the Christ in front of him and he asks the question, what is truth? Well, if you look at Pilate like so many people today, he wasn't really interested in an answer. He was a politically expedient man who was interested in results. And Jesus was not an answer he was willing to entertain. But as we've learned from that great source of wisdom, the matrix, things are not always what they seem. So let me ask you a question. You're the parents and you've got the kids. So first of all, we have to ask ourselves the question, what, is, what do we mean by truth, right? Well, here's good old Aristotle. To say of what is that it is not, or what is not that it is is false, while to say of what is that it is not, and of what is not that it is is true, so that he who says of anything that it is or that it is not will say either what is true or what is false. That nails it right there. <laughs> that cracks it. Now, you need to understand, and there are educators here who know this better than I do, these statements were crafted very carefully so that young men, and there was young men in these days, would walk around with these statements and they would repeat them over and over and over again. They would think about them. They would think with them. So let's read it a little bit more slowly. To say of what is that it is not, your health care plan, oh, sorry, or of what is... <laughs> Let me start again. To say of what is that it is not, or what is not that it is, is false. Well, to say of what is that it is, and of what is not that it is not, is true. So that he who says of anything that it is, or that it is not, will say either what is true or what is false. That is actually profoundly simple, but it's also profoundly useful. This is where we get the notion that the idea of truth is the, is, is the proposition or the property of a statement. A statement about reality is something that corresponds to reality. If I say this is a bottle of water, then that seems to correspond to reality. If I say it's a bottle of Chanel number no. 5, now you old ladies may be running up here to get a hold of it, but you know, it doesn't really look like Chanel, does it? And to say it's a banana is just nonsense. It is a bottle of water. It's a statement if it corresponds to reality. Here is Os Guinness. If in our ordinary speech, telling the truth is telling it like it is, we can say that a statement or an idea or a belief is true if what it is about is as it is in the statement. Belief in something doesn't make it true. Only truth makes a belief true. Again, that might take a little bit of thinking about, but it's actually very, very useful. Now, here's a couple of atheist boys who would not be as acceptable in our time because they were pre-modern or they were sort of pre-postmodern, moderns in that sense. Bertrand Russell, listen to what he says, an atheist. 
He says the truth of a belief is something not involving beliefs or in general any mind at all. So he's not a great Kantian fan. But only the objects of belief. A mind which believes, believes truly when there is a corresponding complex of facts not involving the mind, but only its objects. This correspondence ensures truth and its absence entails falsehood. Hence, we account simultaneously for the two facts that beliefs, A, depend upon minds for their existence, B, do not depend upon minds for their truth. So the truth is something independent. Now that great source of wisdom of the the Oedipus complex and everything else, Sigmund Freud, speaking of science, describing his own methodology, said he, believed, he aimed for a science that sought to arrive at correspondence with reality, that is to say, with what exists outside of us and independently of us. This correspondence with the real external world we call truth. It is the aim of scientific work, even when the practical value of that work does not interest us. This may be self-evident, or it was at one time, but increasingly in our, our world, this is not what people mean by truth. Norman Geisel, the Christian apologist, puts it this way, truth is discovered. It exists independently of our minds. We don't create it. Truth is descriptive. It is the agreement of the mind with reality. Truth is inescapable. It, to deny its existence is to affirm it. We are bound by it. Truth is unchanging. It is the firm standard by which truth claims can or are or can be measured. You know, I've heard many, many times with young people saying, well, oh, I just make up my own realities. No, you don't. Yes, I do. No, I don't. Yes, I do. Go round and round. And I remember a number of years ago with a young guy keeping saying this. And I said, look, you really don't believe that. I said, let's just pretend for a minute that you are Neo in the Matrix, all right? And that you can go out and you can go up onto the roof of the building and we'll all stand outside. And you can imagine that you are Neo. Make up your own reality and fly off the top of the building and we will sit and watch. And he says, I guarantee that reality independent of your consciousness, will take over. And I know he didn't believe that he made up his own reality because he didn't go up on the roof and jump. So this idea that I just compose my own, it sounds good, good in a classroom, it sounds good across a bar, it sounds good, but it's actually not true. We respond to reality. We do not make it up. It is independent of us. Nicholas Walterstorff said this, if I believe of something that it is a duck, that's true of it if and only if it is a duck. And if that is indeed true of it, it's not true of it relative to some conceptual scheme. It's just true, period. Thoughts are true or false of things, period, not relative to something else. But what we're dealing with in America, in the lives of our children, in your own life, in the lives of your friends, is the quest for reality. As a Christian, we need to get this word right front and center in our vocabulary. Because sometimes people think that believers are about make-believe, pie in the sky, escapism. I'm not interested in that, are you? If Christianity isn't true, I'm out of here, trust me. I would only do what I'm doing. I would only have gone through the things I've gone through if Christ was real and if the Christian faith was true. Eurythmics in their song, Sweet Dreams, told us everybody's looking for something. You too, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Now, these are just a sampling. I could give you literally hundreds. I've got, I've got files full of this kind of stuff. I collect it. Because what you see all around us in culture is hungers and questions for answers. I'm looking for love. I'm looking for meaning. I'm looking for things. But here's a caveat I want to give you. Do I have to like it in order for it to be true? What do I mean? You see, almost we've wrapped around a feelings and a sense of taste and something around the, the truth-seeking uh, idea that if truth is nice, it must be something nice. And let me illustrate this for you. And I don't want to offend anybody. Is anyone here a dentist? My <laughs> deepest apologies. You know, I don't really like going to the dentist. I never did. I never did. You know, I, they, they goose them all up now and they have nice silent machines. And, but you know, we all know when I was a kid, they have those little machines that go, and they want to get those things in your mouth and they stick, you know, little logs from trees and things that you know, jam your mouth while you're dry, you're drowning and they're slobbering and, you know, they're coming in there with concrete and who knows what. It, it's just a dreadful, it's not quite that bad, I must admit, but you know, that's what it feels like. You know, and when I go into the dentist, I like a clean and polish. You know, I want to come in and just, and when I mean a clean and polish, I don't want those steel things digging holes underneath. I mean, I just mean the clean and polish and get back out of there. That's all I, hey, I know my teeth. I live with them. They're there all the time. They are mine. But when I get in there, I find out that dentists are only interested in the real treatment. They want to give you the full treatment because they're interested in things like health and decay. 
whatever. And all this kind of strange stuff because they want me to be better, to do stuff that I wouldn't do. You don't have to like the truth for the truth to be true. You just have to respond to it. Sometimes the truth is uncomfortable. Neil, by the way, learned that in The Matrix, even in the silly film. It was battery fodder, but never mind. G.P. Moreland puts it this way. This is why truth is so powerful. It allows us to cooperate with reality, whether spiritual or physical, and tap into its power. As we learn to think correctly about God, specific scriptural teaching, the soul, and other important aspects of a Christian worldview, we are placed in touch with God in those realities. We thereby gain access to the power available for us to live in the kingdom of God. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, to whom was that said? It was to his earliest followers. Jesus was raised as a Jewish boy. He spoke the Shema twice a day. He went to synagogue. He was a, an ordered man. So when he said in the midst of a Jewish environment that I am the way, the truth, and the life, those words carried an astonishing power. It could only mean one thing. It wasn't an invitation to a private reality. It wasn't to some selective individual cho choice or comfort. It was a statement about the nature of the universe. Now, if there is a God, and if that God is noble, and if that God is what is Jesus, then he is claiming to be the connecting point to all reality, something that Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris find absolutely pre preposterous and absolutely horrible. But it doesn't matter if they find it preposterous or horrible. The question is, is it true? And if it's true, it has enormous implications. But now you ask me the question. You did, didn't you? How do we know and how do we know that we know? Gosh, that's a hard one, isn't it? I mean, the kids were asking that, some of them today, and we always ask that at some level. How do I really know? How can I know? Well, how can you know anything? It's not easy to know things. You see, many perceptive thinkers and writers have recognized that one of the errors of the 20th century was the belief in scientism. What is scientism? The belief that science is the only game in town. And so what is happening increasingly in America and the Western world is that we are moving from science as method to science as philosophy. And there's a problem here. Science does very well as a method. It does very badly as a philosophy. Ian Hutchison, who teaches at MIT himself, a very, a very accomplished society, a scientist, wrote a marvelous book called Monopolizing Knowledge. And he's so annoyed at this, here's how he defines scientism. He says it is the belief that all valid knowledge is science. Scientism says, or at least implicitly assumes, that rational knowledge is scientific, and everything else that claims the status of knowledge is just superstition, irrationality, emotion, or nonsense. This means everything within the humanities, sorry all you classical scholars and teachers, and everything within religion, just nonsense, superstition. He says, on the contrary, I shall argue there are many important beliefs, secular as well as religious, which are justified and rational, but not scientific. And if that is so, then scientism is a ghastly intellectual mistake. You see, where did this come from? In the Enlightenment, the philosophical Enlightenment, there was a human desire, there was a, a strong desire for certainty. We wanted to be certain about our knowledge. If we could be certain, we could have order and control. We are everywhere. Boy, America's like that, don't we? We want to know everything. We want to do the latest research. We want to consult the latest philosophers. We want to get information. Why? So that we can order and control. What? Well, everything. Our husbands, our wives, our golf game, our stock market, our children, everything. We want to understand it by rational men and women in control of our destiny. But Michael Polanyi grew up in Hungary during the Soviet era, and he understood that what the Soviets were pushing as a form of knowledge was not knowledge, that scientists came to their understanding of reality not the way the Soviets were saying. It was a propagandistic model, and he wrote a marvelous book called Personal Knowledge, which has been unpacked. Although he wasn't a philosopher by training, he ended up in a chair of philosophy in England after many years. Esther Meek is a Christian philosopher, and she has looked at Polanyi's work, and she introduces us to a very simple book called Longing to Know. And the whole book is a philosophy of knowledge. How do we know, and how do we know that we know? That's the question. But it's done through the understanding of everyday lives and relationships. And here's Esther Meek's definition of the knowing process. She says, knowing is the responsible human struggle to rely on clues, to focus on a coherent pattern, and to submit to its reality. Let me ask you, how many of you like Sherlock Holmes? Anyone? Okay. CSI? NCIS? 
Law and Order? Oh, come on. Some of you might. Uh, you, I mean, everybody watches Detective Story. Some of them, at least one of them, you know? All right. Elementary. How do these, these programs, <laughs> my dear Watson, uh, how do these things actually work? When the TV programs come up, there's a very simple pattern to them, and this is the way, in fact, they even have this now in sociology, the CSI effect, where people think you can solve a problem in one hour, which, <laughs> go figure. It begins with a crime, right? You walk in on a crime, and there's a dead body in the ground, and they find the crime, and they're obviously looking for who done it. Not in the, the game, but in the, the, the crime. So we begin with clues. That's where it all, we look for clues. And all of us do this in everyday life. We look for clues. I mean, was there the hair, the DNA, and what happened? Was it random? Was it, uh, you know, what was all this information? From the clues, they move to the second stage, which is looking for a pattern. They're been trying to find out, was this man with this woman at this time in this place? Was it Professor Plum with the candlestick in the, you know, in the library? Or who did it? Or who done it? Or whatever happened? We look for a pattern. Or was it random? A meteor dropped out of space and cracked her head open while she was making omelets in front of the, the, you know, the, the oven. Was it a random choice? Or did it look like it was a planned event? When they have clues, you begin to get a pattern. And when the pattern begins to develop, if the pattern is right, it leads them to a focus, which is a suspect. And of course, in NCIS and CSI, it works every time. And we have the person arrested at the end of the program. <laughs> clues, pattern, and focus. That's how life works. Think about romance, young man, young woman, or older man, older woman. The first time you saw her, she walked in and she smiled. Was that a clue? No, she didn't have her glasses on. <laughs> the second time she had her glasses on, she smiled. No, that's a clue. And then her friend drops off a little note on your table and says, you know, hey, Susan thinks you're cute. <laughs> no, that's a pattern. I've got a clue in a pattern here. We're going somewhere. Let's go on a date. And then once you go on the date and you meet for a little while and you find out she's been watching you for some time, she finds out you've been watching her and you get married and you find out love was, was there. And so it gave a focus of a relationship that is not the end of the knowledge experience. It's the beginning of it because it begins to yield continuous knowledge. And ladies and gentlemen, this could be in mathematics. This could be in mechanics. It could be in computer programs or it can be in knowing God. There are clues all around us in the universe, clues that seem to talk of design or something that indicate there's something there rather than nothing. What pattern but best explain them, randomness or design? Is there an author behind it all? Are all theories equal opportunity providers? So when then when it comes to ideas and, and worldviews, whether that's Islam or atheism or existentialism, we have to compare, evaluate and judge. I recently went out and bought a new car. In fact, I bought the car, not the one that I've hired, because there's a story here. My son wanted me to buy a Dodge Challenger, and I ended up buying a Ford Explorer, because I'm older, I need more room to get up and in, and I like my car. But with the rental car I got when I came to California, it was a Dodge Challenger, it's really cool, I must admit, I like it. But comparison is the mother of clarity. We have to compare things. So when we're looking at worldviews and they're not all equal opportunity employers, what are we looking for? Well, we look for at least three things as we test worldviews, systems. We look for logical consistency. A true worldview will not contradict itself. Does it really hold together? Does it explain the depth of life? Does it have answers to the breadth of life? Factuality, does it fit the facts as we have to see them? And viability, can we live with a worldview that was true? For many years, I spent my life traveling in and out of Eastern Europe. I worked in the Soviet system. And it was interesting. The idea was, you know, they say quality of man, this great socialist vision when everybody would all be equal. But they weren't equal because if you had hard currency, you could buy shops and beryoshkas or you could buy, you know, all kinds of Western products. And, and all of the Illuminati of the communist system went to datches and in big houses and all lived above the proletariat. The illusion of equality was never, was never really there. In a reality, it's an inviolable worldview. In the movie Contact, I don't know how many of you ever saw it, you know the program from Carl Sagan, The Search for Extraterrestrial uh, Life? Jodie Foster plays the, the, the role of a scientist who is looking for, she's convinced the ET is out there somewhere. Her dad has died when she's young. She's traumatized by her death. She's a committed scientist. She has a brief, a, a brief fling with a Catholic, a lapsed Catholic priest and has this affair and then carries on her life on this journey. Eventually, one day, with all these satellite, all these uh, uh, sa um, transmitters pointing to space, they finally get a message back and it's coded, it has specified intelligence, and so they know it came from a source, an intelligent source. 
And as they get this, this information and they decode it, they find that it points to the construction of what seems to be a vessel that will transport her, they assume, to where the aliens are. Unfortunately, the nutty Christians show up in some Pentecostal group or someone ends up blowing up the first construction because these bad, evil Christians who are anti-science, you know, they come up into the world apocalypse and all this kind of thing. And so they have to start again. This time, Jodie Foster herself is the one who is in the ship. So they now build machine number two. And as the thing begins to spin and starts doing all its motion, it's going so fast and the ball drops with her in this capsule. And, and from the vantage point of those observing, it just drops right to the water. And it all stops. But from her vantage point, she has actually gone on a journey to the other side of the galaxy or somewhere. And she meets E.T. And by the way, E.T. looks a little bit like our dad. So it's pretty cool that E.T. is nice to take that on for her. You know, and just psychologically accommodate to her needs. But there you go. E.T.'s are like that sometimes. Um, and so she has this encounter. But here she comes back. And now she has to appear before a Senate Judicial Committee because she has they've wasted billions of dollars of American government money on a funding expense of science to give an experience of something that never happened. They don't believe her. She, as a rational scientist, is in an incredible position of, of having an experience that she can't explain, that she knows is real. And she can't deny it because everything that happened was real. And the only person that believes her, guess who, is, of course, the Catholic priest, who has a transcendent worldview and has room, if you like, for these other things. Now, I'm not authorizing E.T. All I'm saying is that the film plays with the question of knowledge. How do we know and how do we know that we know? One young man asked me today, what if we could send someone back for the dead? No one's ever been back from the dead. This was a question that was given to him by non-Christians. I said, but surely that's the whole point. Isn't that what the gospel says? That one has risen from the dead. That someone came from the other side. That we have made contact. Listen to John chapter 1. It says it so beautifully and so clearly in the gospel of John. In verses 14 through 18. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We saw his glory, glory, as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his, all, his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. And the word there means he has exegeted him. He has explained, he has shown to us. Now again, this may be absolute nonsense. Maybe a lot of make-believe. Or it may be true. I believe it's true. I believe it's a description of reality. I was speaking to doctors on this very subject a couple of years ago in Oregon. And someone asked me, how do you as a Christian justify your beliefs? And I gave them five different tests. I said, first of all, by my experience. It's not the only thing. But I can chart an actual journey from unbelief through questions to encounter. I know a time, in my case, this isn't the same for every Christian. People have different experiences. Some roll into Christianity. Some just kind of believed it when they were young, and they still do, and they know God really and truly. You don't have to have a dramatic conversion, but some do. I did. And for me, Christ became real in June of Scotland in 1977. But secondly, then, my reason kicked in because I had this experience that then put me at enmity with all these people around me. They thought I was a nut job. They thought I had lost it. I'd been brainwashed. So I had to read books and find answers. I read books by Charles Colson and people like C.S. Lewis and Malcolm Muggeridge. And I found out they had, they had evidence from the resurrection. They had biblical passages. So I began to read those things the, by my, uh, using my reason to explore. By evidence and fit, Douglas Grothaus put this this way. The correspondence view of truth entails that propositional or declar declarative statements are subject to verification and falsification. A statement can be proven false if it can be shown to disagree with objective reality. Jesus said he was a savior. I have found him to be a savior. Jesus said he was Lord. I have found him to be my Lord. The early church confessed this. And I believe that millions of people both in history and around the world today have confessed those things and found them to be true. But by scripture, is the Bible a reliable book? This book has been torn apart, laughed at, mocked by the Da Vinci Code and everything for hundreds of years. 
But by architecture, by uh, archaeology, by historical studies, this book has stood the test of time better than anything even remotely like it. The Bible stands the test of time. Does that mean everything in it is easy to swallow? No. Does that mean everything in it is nice? No. But it doesn't need to be nice to be true or real. It has got an accuracy and a reliability. And then by changed lives. I've seen life change all over the world, in, different, in the Muslim world, in the Hindu world. These are evidences of transformation. I asked earlier if all beliefs are equal opportunity providers, and I don't believe they are. Because Christianity offers a God that comes to us in grace, which is unmerited favor. The grace of God is something that I can't earn, that I can't beg for, that is given to me by the kindness of our God. And that is something special. So let me give you some concluding thoughts. Are you ready to fall asleep yet? No? Okay. Concluding thoughts. Esther Meek refers to what Esther Meek refers to as patterns others may describe as a world or a life view. What is that? J.F. Baldwin describes a worldview as your framework for understanding existence, the way that you look at the world. Everybody in this room has a worldview. Osama bin Laden had a worldview. Everybody has a worldview. It's the way you see reality. It's a habitation. Some of you might have a Christian worldview, and some of you might have a half-Christian worldview, or a semi-Christian worldview, or even a non-Christian worldview, even though you've gone to church, because you've never taken time to think it through. What do worldviews do? Well, first of all, we talked about this this morning. They give us a background theory of the universe. What is the nature of reality? They provide a theory of who or what a man or woman is. They offer a diagnosis of what is wrong, and they provide an answer, a solution for putting things right. So when we put the question of what is truth against these questions, and I'm suggesting to you they're not all equal opportunity providers, then I want to share just this quote here from Alistair McGrath. The belief that all religions are ultimately expressions of the same transcendent reality is at best illusory and at worst oppressive. Illusory because it lacks any substantiating basis and oppressive because it involves the systematic imposition of the agenda of those in positions of intellectual power on the religions and those who adhere to them. The, this liberal imposition of this pluralistic meta-narrative on religions is utterly a claim to mastery both in the sense of having a Nietzschean authority and a power to mold material according to one's own will, and in the sense of being able to relativize all religions by having access to a privileged standpoint. Can't tell you many times someone has told me all religions are fundamentally the same, but superficially different. All that tells me is that the person who says that hasn't studied any of them. And yet we take this as a mantra. They are profoundly different. And if you want to read a book by a non-Christian on this subject, read Stephen Prothero's book, God is Not One, where he shows the different story that different religions say and why important they are. So knowing things versus knowing God. I was raised, and I told my story today in a typical Scottish home, I was convinced there was no God and that morality was a social convention. And I lived that way for my early life. No rules, no God, no limits. And then in June 77, everything changed. Since then, I've been exposed to questions. I've had to read books by Marx, Freud, Nietzsche, Darwin, Bart Ehrman, all kinds of skepticism, throwing all kinds of things, saying that everything I believe is not true or is false or is based on some conspiracy by old men 500 years ago who got together and voted and made up the Bible and all this kind of nonsense. But I came to realize that the way we know a person, the way we relate to God is distinct from how we relate just to ideas and objects. If God is knowable in Christianity, the primary issue of the Christian life is whether or not God can be known. And I can have an I-it, or sorry, an I-thou versus an I-it relationship with the living God. And so the words grace, faith, spirit, bear a content in the Christian life and to us as human beings that are something that can change your life forever. If you experience grace in your life, if you understand the gift of faith, if you receive the Spirit of God, it changes you. And this changed my view of reality and truth. Because before I lived by the Stuart McAllister philosophy of life, if someone crossed me, I hit them. And I had friends like that. I was always angry. But now God had given me something, a fixed point. It wasn't based on my feelings, my opinions. It was based on something else. Blaise Pascal said this, those who lead disorderly lives tell those who are normal that it's they who deviate from nature. And they think they're following nature themselves, just as those on board a ship think the people on the shore are moving away. Language is the same everywhere. We need a fixed point to judge it. 
The harbor is the judge of those aboard the ship. But where are we going to find a harbor in morals? And this is one of the greatest questions facing this country, facing your home, facing your family, facing your church today. We are all over the map with no fixed points anymore. Everything is up to opinion. Everything is up to subjectivity. And ladies and gentlemen, this opens us for anarchy. Pascal says, when everything is moving at once, nothing appears to be moving as on board ship. When everyone is moving towards depravity, no one seems to be moving. But if someone stops, he shows up the others who are rushing on by acting as a fixed point. So Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the midst of the Gulag understood that depravity wasn't in the communist system. Depravity wasn't just a part of the guards. Depravity was all around in all human beings. And Solzhenitsyn said this in the midst of the Gulag archipelago. Let the lie come, but not through me. You want to see change in your country, in your home. It happens one American at a time. Let the lie come, but not through me. So let me close with Christianity and the truth. I have Christians who are friends, who are doctors, philosophers, some who are lawyers, executives, military officers, academics. They all believe in objective truth. They teach and work in an arena where specific credentials and procedures are both essential and practical to what they do day by day. They and I see no conflict between truth in its widest sense and the truth in their faith. They're not two kinds of faith, two kinds of truth, public truth and private truth. There is one truth, and it is seamless, and it comes from the creator and the sustainer. We all seek truth as that which corresponds to reality, as that which is coherent in its claims and in its evidences, and as that which actually works at the level of everyday life. So I can't do any better than close with the words of C.S. Lewis. Lewis said this, Christianity is not a patent medicine. Christianity claims to give an account of the facts, to tell you what the real universe is like. Its account of the universe may be true or it may not. And once the question is before you, then your natural inquisitiveness must make you want to know the answer. If Christianity is untrue, then no honest man will want to believe it, however helpful it might be. But if it is true, every honest man will want to believe it, even if it gives him no help at all. For Lewis, it wasn't a question of comfort. It was a question of reality. Thank you. I was reading the, uh, on the Yahoo homepage today that there is a, uh, I guess, this phenomenon, especially here in Southern California. This one's talking about um, a church in Pasadena uh, of atheists. Mm -hmm. And they, they really went out of their way to, to say, you know, we're not a religion. This is not a religion. <laughs> but as we've all known, atheism is a religion. It's a belief system. It's a worldview. I just want to know what your thoughts on that would be and how you would approach yeah. that, you know, from a, an apologetic perspective. Well, the hard thing is very hard to someone. Everybody wants to self-define. And so it's very difficult to come across to another community and try to tell them how to define them when they self-define themselves that way. What we need to do is to find sources within their own community who say those things. And probably one of the greatest voices who has said that, there's two voices actually, John Gray of the London School of Economics has written extensively on his book uh, Black Mass and he, he talked about Enlightenment's wake. He is a very disillusioned professor of economics who has looked at the whole drift of the 20th century and its tragedy and believes that in the Enlightenment rationalism was a religion, and that people like Dr. Uh, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett and company are actually doing exactly what you said. Another person you might want to look at is, is the historian Michael Burley, B-U-R-L-E-I-G-H, and he had written a history originally of the, the Nazis, but his, his historical movement took him back and forward, and so he's written a book called Sacred Causes, and shows the religious element within the Nazi party and what became, when, when God was removed from the public sphere in the French Revolution, and then increasingly in Western Europe, his attributes were relocated into the government and into power. And so what we find is nothing worse than civil religion when it's deified. And we are seeing, those of you who are Lewis fans, you're seeing a growth in America towards a kind of a spiritual paganism in which science is married to mysticism. And these kind of things are growing all around us. So it's a time indeed to, uh, be, but with dealing with the new atheists, I would say 
or someone like uh, uh, David Berlinski, a great book called The Devil's Delusion. Uh, marvelous, not a believer, Jewish background man, but very sympathetic to Christianity. And his book, The Devil's Delusion, is an enormous demolition job of the new, new atheism. Uh, the first one was John Gray, London School of Economics. You'll see, if you Google him, you'll see about 20 books. And Michael Burley, um, who's a historian. Um, at one point, you had listed three uh, tests, I think. Um, and I think two of the last two were factual and viable. Could you tease that out a little bit more? Well, factual is that, like for instance, if everything, say in Hinduism, if everything is Maya, you have a hard time doing science, everything is illusion. How can you work in a test tube or in a, in a, a laboratory with real stuff if it's all illusion? You'd hard yourself, convince yourself you're doing something valid, right? So in Christianity, because we believe that God created the world and that, that a law-governed universe is a part of God's world distinct from God, but in relation to him, that we believe that science is a legitimate pursuit, in fact, a necessary pursuit to further human knowledge. So it's in that sense that our worldview uh, is, it deals with real world, uh, uh, both it, its measurement and its functionality, and that we can sustain it. We don't avoid it, we don't run away from it, we embrace it and work with it as not a problem to be solved, but as a means to an end that God has already declared. And I think that's the same in the third, the third test was on or, or viability, well again, it's more existential in the sense of experiential relevance. If I need one, only one test to me personally is the doctrine of original sin. I don't see how you can get away from that. I mean, any of us who have children and any of us who are honest enough with ourselves know that there's a fundamental flaw. We don't know what it is, but it is there. And it, it grows. Now, you can put children in the nicest environments, pour love upon them, and they can still turn out incredibly nasty and greedy and selfish and horrible. And you wonder why. You buy them more toys, you give them more stuff, and they just get more and more nasty. You think, what in the world is going on here? Because there's something in them. Now, it doesn't mean to say you can't love them as parents or we love them as, as human beings, but that, that thing is a flaw. That, to me, is only explained in the Christian worldview adequately. It's not explained by pure psychology and determinism and not, you know, uh, uh, that it's just my DNA enough. Otherwise, you would think that we'd evolved and now into somewhat better. Maybe the time we get to Star Trek, the next, 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 next generation will really, really be there, but we're not there yet. In fact, Star Trek goes, we're retrograding, by the way, so. But that's a whole other discussion for the arts. <laughs> What's your view on uh, needing to be regenerated even to see truth? Uh, is it can you see the truth of God before being regenerated? Well, there's two things involved in that. I think that you can come up to the, like the Jews, the Jewish people at all could come up to the tabernacle. They could come to the temple, but let's use the tabernacle. It was a, bit, a little bit better because the pillar of fire was there by day and the, pillar, the cloud, the cloud by day, the fire by night. And they could see the Shekinah, the glory of God descending upon the holiest of all. So people could come up, they could offer sacrifices, but they could never go into the holiest of all. Only one priest, one time a year, Yom Kippur could offer that offering. So I think there are things, and of course Catholic theology particularly would look at this way more that natural theology would bring us up to a certain point. Romans chapter 1 makes it clear there are two things about God that are clearly seen. His divine nature and his eternal power, Romans chapter 1, 18 through 20. But that doesn't tell us who God is. So I think what reason and nature alone can bring us to the existence of, of transcendence, they do not bring us to the knowledge of God. That, to me, is where special revelation kicks in. And I think that's confirmed. Lewis, C.S. Lewis, and he saw this early on, but he developed it much more as his theology began to grow. Lewis felt to the natural man there are only two real choices. You will be either an atheist, a monist of one kind, or a pantheist. That's why, you know, New Age movement, all these religions, they make sense to the rational person because they sense transcendence. They touch the garment of something, but they don't go all the step to see who's wearing the garment. That takes revelation, where the one on the other side has spoken to us. And so regeneration, the work of the Spirit, then becomes essential. So that's why I believe we preaching the gospel, natural uh, philosophy and these things are useful tools to get people up towards the clear away the clutter but they still have the act of faith where there has to be the encounter with God or there's nothing there. You talked about the importance of a worldview and uh, people's worldviews. I'd like for you to maybe explain or uh, give some uh, advice for how to uh, purposefully and 
powerfully sculpt the worldview of yourself and those around you? To sculpt your worldview, I think what is to become intentional about, I mean, one of the things I'd probably do is I'd get myself a couple of good books on it. I mean, obviously there's books like Richard, uh, James Sires, The Universe Next Door, these do comparative, but there are other texts that actually talk about more indwelling. There's a lot more work being done this on journeying into it. Ravi comes at the whole idea of worldview through the questions of origins, meaning, morality, and destiny. But that's more as a, as a leading towards an evangelistic conversation. For me, what I've done, I would go back, um, I found one author in particular, a man called Colin Gunton, very, very helpful. And I, there's one book in particular that was useful for forming some of my own thoughts, was called The One, the Three, and the Many, which was the Bampton Lectures on the Trinity. Because what Gunton did was as a European theologian, he was looking back at the 19th and 20th century, he saw the failures of the church and theology to answer the questions the culture was then asking. And so what he does is he goes back to the gospel and looks at the primacy of scripture on God revealed. And from that, he began to then give, the, if you like, the architecture of the worldview rooted in the revelation of God as, as Trinity, essentially, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what that led to in ethics and morality in other areas, piece by piece. So I would suggest that that might be a good, a good tool, a starting point, especially for someone like yourself who's done a lot of thinking in these areas. I think you would probably find something very meaningful in there that you could build from. Thank you. I heard from um, various people that your testimony was a wonderful thing to hear. And if we had a couple of minutes, wondered if you could share that with us. Sure. Um, I, I grew up in a non-Christian home. My, my mother was, had been raised in the church and walked away because my, she met my dad after the, the, the Second World War. He was RAF. And he was a ticket to freedom. She was in one of those very narrow fundamentalist type. It was a Nazarene church. And dad was the party, you know, the dancing, drinking, just free living kind of guy. He was cool. And so when we grew up, I grew up in a home where there was no God, there was no Christianity, there was nothing like that. But there was also a lot of just frustration and anger. Um, you know, as we're talking about different children, I had two brothers, one who's 12 years younger and one who was two years older. And, you know, I was the one that could never shut up. The kid that always had a comment and always spoke out of turn, so I was always getting slapped or pushed or, you know, shut up, be quiet, blah, blah, blah. And really what that did was it just built up a, a, a series of resentments. Um, when I was 15, I ended up in a fight with my home with my father. I came home drunk and he was, had been drinking, he hit me. And then I just flew out of him and, and by that time I was fighting a lot. So he was, he was a middle class businessman. He wasn't expecting his son to jump on him. Um, and that led to me leaving home at 15. My wife is still astonished as this is Americans because you can't imagine that parents would do that, but my parents let me go. And I went out at 15 years of age and got a job and started working and it was hardly making any money. So then I began to look for ways to make money and um, ended up working in a dance hall as a bouncer. Took up weightlifting and things like this. And then I found what was for me a new career. It was a community. I had these guys who were all thugs. They wanted, uh, and it was lots of fun. We were working in a big discotheque. So there were lots of girls and lots of everything. And uh, that's, that's the way life was. And so I was doing pretty well. So 21 years of age, I'm, I'm making lots of money and I could drive home and visit my parents just to annoy them. Um, I'd drive up in an E-Type Jaguar. I, I was driving American cars at that time. You know, it was all sort of parade, look at me, you know. Your dad's the middle class dude and I'm making more money than he was. I knew uh, I was making a lot more money than he was. Mind you, I was taking his, mind he was earning his. Um, there was a young lady who was being controlled by a policeman and I was asked to go and help her get her money back from this cop, so I did. And then we ended up living together. So one day she walks in, this is after about a year, she asked me, what do I think about Jesus? Nothing. I never thought about Jesus, wasn't interested in religion. I mean, that's repulsive. I am not, you know, didn't want anything to do with that. It was just disgusting. We split up, and then after about two weeks, she uh, called me to come and meet these Christians. And I went and met Christians for the first time. And I went with the idea that I might beat them up or do something. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but that was how I felt. I mean, I, I'm just I'm telling it as it was then, not now, obviously. Um, but I was ambushed. I came into that house absolutely sure there was no God. This is nonsense. They've just messed with my girlfriend's head. Then somewhere during the night, they're sharing the Bible and we're doing some of this worldview stuff. They weren't intellectual. They were just honest people who loved. And they just told. And they started reading Bible verses and sharing all this stuff. And I went to a place where, oops, there might be a God. And 
by the end of the evening, I became pretty sure there was a God. And so that night, I prayed, and Christ saved me. So that was in 1977. I went out very quickly on mission. I went to Eastern Europe. I got arrested four times. I was put in jail in Yugoslavia for 40 days. In two weeks in Czechoslovakia, I was arrested in East Germany and Russia. But that was just par for the course. We were just, but what astonished me was because it was the gospel. These people were putting us in jail because we believed in Jesus. I found that hard to believe. But now I understand this is a high stakes game. This isn't for easy believism and it's not about just going to church and being nice, goody two shoes people. It's about reality and truth and it costs you everything. So in a nutshell. I ask a lot of our speakers who come through um, kind of a variation of the same question. Our kids are, you spend a lot of time with our students today and a lot of them are going to be embarking on the next uh, phase of their education and mm -hmm. higher education. And um, we found that about our graduates, about half of them have chosen a Christian college, half have chosen a secular college. Some are uh, ready to be salt and light out there. Mm -hmm. Some still want, some might want some different things. They want a different yeah. kind of community. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are. I know that you have two grown children. Yeah. And I was kind of wondering how you thought about that. Well, I think as many parents do, it depends on the child. I think we need to see the kind of child that, that they are in terms of their temperament and their ability to cope. I mean, I know some kids that, you know, going into an Ivy League school was like, oh, bring it on, you know, let me at them. And they, really, and they did well, some, but there are others who were in timid and scared and they would be destroyed by professors or by the social uh, setup. So we really need to know the child. We also need to know the institutions. Because I think some Christian institutions are toxic to Christian faith. I've seen many a child destroyed by legalism and by stupidities in Christian uh, environments that did them an injustice as well. So I would say pick carefully. Uh, there are great colleges and great schools that really focus on making people, giving them a good education and forming them spiritually so that they deal with life. If we try to create Christians who live in a bubble, then we will always fail. Because eventually, especially in a porous world today with 24-7 media and connectivity, you have to give them a heart. We have to form them in their soul that they have a rugged in, uh, uh, um, sense of what the truth is and they're willing to pay the cost of that. But picking then, I would pick carefully and I'd pick by negotiation. And I think the traditions you have in this country are great where parents go with the kids and vet schools and check them out. I think that's a marvelous thing. And, and to help them not be pressured. Because sometimes the choice they make, they're, they're needing mom and dad's a little bit of coaching. So between telling them where to go and helping them to make a wise decision, I think is the key in some of these things.